guess what? You have been chosen to be a consultant for a big Hollywood blockbuster. Which one, you might ask? Well, only the most requested action sequel of all time. Tremors 5. You see, there's a little trouble on the set when filming, and they've requested someone with a psychological mind to make sure that this incredible piece of film history gets made. So put on your lab coats, ladies and gents, because in order to save the day, we need to run an experiment. You see, the reason these bigwigs are seeking your assistance is because a lot of the actors are forgetting their lines. Now, you quickly disregard the fact that they're probably just not good actors, and instead, put on your critical thinking caps to see if there's anything in the environment that could be affecting their memory. Being that the production company wanted an authentic feel, they decided to spring for a subterranean shoot. The only problem with this is with the actors filming for such a long time underground, they aren't getting any sunlight. You reflect back on your high school anatomy class, and you seem to recall that vitamin D is important for the production of memory. But you can't go to Hollywood with just speculation. So what do you do? You run an experiment. Now, in my previous videos, we talked about descriptive methods and correlational studies. But experiments are the big enchiladas of science. You see, an experiment can tell us about cause and effect, because it manipulates one or more factors to observe the effect on some behavior or mental process. An experiment does this by assigning participants to two or more groups, and with the exception of the manipulation done by the experimenter, both groups are relatively equal. Now, if we're watching the groups and they tend to differ on a specific measure of interest, then we can say with confidence that it was the manipulation that caused the change. In other words, if we want to find out if lack of vitamin D is causing the actor's memory lapse, then an experiment is the way to do it. So let's design a simple experiment that will show us vitamin D's effect on memory. For this to work, you're going to need two groups. The first is called the experimental group. And in this one, you're exposed to the treatment variable, or a measurable characteristic. In this case, they're given a vitamin D supplement. The second group is the control group. And in this one, the participants are not exposed to the treatment variable. Or in other words, they're given a sugar pill instead. Now you might be asking, why do we give the control group a sugar pill? Why don't we give one group vitamin D and then the other group nothing? Well, the sugar pill acts as a pretend treatment, or a placebo. This is an inert substance that has no benefit, but is administered as if it does. You see, the human mind is a tricky thing, because it is possible for a participant to feel better simply by believing that they're being treated. So if you administer a placebo and the control group doesn't get better, then you controlled for one variable while strengthening your hypothesis even further. Now if you remember, previously we stated that a hypothesis is like a statement that can be used to test a prediction. So our hypothesis here is that participants housed in a laboratory setting without natural light who are given vitamin D supplements will perform better on a memory test than participants in the same laboratory setting who receive a sugar pill. So if the group receiving the vitamin D does better than the other group, then we can attribute the difference to that treatment. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, there's actually a couple things we have to talk about before acting out this experiment. In my previous video on descriptive methods, we talked about random sampling, in that you gather a random sample of people to represent a population. In an experiment, you break it down one step further, and use something called random assignment. This is where you assign participants to either the experimental or control group, through a random process so every person has an equal chance of being assigned to either. You do this to reduce the possibility of some participant characteristics influencing the findings later on. Let's say that you have a sample, and in that sample you have four pro chess players, and all of them are assigned to one group. Well, that's probably going to skew the results later on when they take the memory test. Even though it's possible that they could end up in the same group through random assignment, it's more likely that they're going to be separated, making both groups a little more balanced. Now, to restate a previous point, and to give you a little more vocabulary, the only difference between the experimental group and the control group is the thing you're manipulating. In this case, it's vitamin D intake. This is called the independent variable, or IV. It's the one thing that researchers deliberately change in the experiment. So are you giving them 500 milligrams of vitamin D a day, or none? See, the amount of vitamin D you administer, that is the independent variable. Now, the counterpoint to that is called the dependent variable, or DV, and this is the characteristic or response that researchers are trying to measure. In this study, the DV would be how well participants do on a memory test. 
Okay, one of the last things we're gonna talk about before carrying out our study is extraneous variables. These are characteristics of the environment or participants that potentially interfere with the study. Let's say it's late at night, my participants are in their beds, and I'm rocking out to my new Capital Cities record on full blast. The participants aren't gonna be able to sleep well, and they're probably gonna do terrible on next day's memory test. See, the extraneous variables in this example are the fact that I'm playing my music way too loud for them to get any sleep. Similar to the extraneous variable, there's also something called a confounding variable. Now this occurs in sync or alongside the change of the independent variable. Let's say that you have two lab assistants. One is a regular old guy, and the other is Hunky McHunkster. Now whatever group he goes to, he's gonna win over the participants' hearts and probably unknowingly motivate them to do better on the memory test. When this occurs, you don't really know what influenced the scores. Was it the confounding variable or was it the independent variable? In a situation like this, it's probably best just to have the same researcher for both groups. Now we don't tell the participants what type of treatment they're receiving because this will influence how they do. This is called a single blind study. But as we now see, researchers can influence the participants as well, sometimes without even knowing it. If a researcher knows which group is receiving the treatment, then they could unknowingly tip the participant off. Like an innocent, wow, you're doing great for the control group and then nothing for the experimental group. This is why it's good to keep your researchers in the dark also, and this is called a double blind study, where even they don't know who's receiving the treatment. <sighs> okay, we're ready to do an experiment. First thing we do is we take our sample of participants and randomly assign them to either the experimental or control group. After we control for extraneous and confounding variables, we then administer the independent variable. For the experimental group, it'll be the daily dose of vitamin D. And for the control group, it'll be the placebo or a sugar pill. Then after a certain amount of time, we give them the dependent variable or the memory test. After scoring the exams and calculating the results, we see that the control group scored an average score of 67%. We then look at the experimental group and their collective average was a score of 97%. With these results, we can safely say that administering vitamin D improved the participant's memory. Yay, we saved the movie! Oh, and what is this? Is it my script of Tremors 5 that I wrote three years ago? I mean, I guess if you wanted to email me about producing a movie, then you could. No, but seriously, email me. Thank you for watching my video on psychological experiments. That was a lot of information, but if you're yearning for more knowledge, then take a look at some of my other videos on my Psychology 101 segment and be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can keep up to date on future videos coming out soon.